Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Practitioners Insights, Valuation Drivers and Key Success Factors for Indian Banks, hosted by CFA Institute. I would like to take a moment to welcome our audience from around the world joining us remotely. Uh, my name is Sivanand Ramachandran. Um, this is my first time doing this series for the regulars of this uh, Practitioners Insights webinars. Um, you know, so this is the first time. Uh, you know, we are grateful for Srinivas for doing this series for a long time. Uh, so my name is Sivanand. I'm a director of Capital Markets Policy India at CFA Institute, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Um, so I started my career at a bank, uh, so which is quite topical for today's uh, session. Uh, I worked at I, I started my career at ICICI Bank Market Risk Department. And then I moved on to um, you know, investment side. I worked at uh, MSCI and Morningstar for uh, several years, uh, look like you know, developing quantitative strategies uh, before joining CFA Institute. Um, so in my current role, I look at uh, policy issues which impact capital markets, including corporate governance, ESG, and pensions. Um, I, have, I hold a master's in business administration from IM Lucknow. Um, and I also hold a Chartered Financial Analyst or CFA, uh, CFA designation and CIPM. And just yesterday, I cleared the CFA Institute certificate in ESG investing. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's, that's all about me. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I have a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, today's webinar is uh, scheduled for 60 minutes, including Q&A. Uh, we will be leaving time for Q&A after the presentation, and uh, <clears throat> throughout the presentation, I'll be asking a few questions uh, of Mr. Sheshadri, and I'll encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation as well. And you can do so by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your viewer and typing your question in the box. Uh, the webinar presentation will be available to view after the presentation concludes in the chat box. Uh, we value your feedback, so please complete the evaluation survey uh, before you sign off today. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, Mr. Seshadri Sen, CFA. Uh, Mr. Seshadri uh, is the head of uh, research at Alchemy Capital Management since 2018. He is the founding one of the founding members of CFA Society India, uh, obtaining his CFA charter way back in 2001. Uh, his equity research career has spanned three decades uh, with leading brokerages and fund management houses, including JP Morgan, Macquarie Capital, ST Asia, Sokjan, and ICICI Prudential Asset Management. He specializes in banks and financials. Uh, he holds a business administration uh, degree from XLRI Jamshedpur and a bachelor's degree in science and economics from Presidency College, Kolkata. Uh, it's my pleasure, uh, Mr. Sheshadri, uh, over to you. Thank you, Shiva, and congratulations on, on getting the ESG uh, well done. I, I, it's, it's a tough one, so, so, so really well done on that. And uh, thank you to the CFA Institute and the CFA Society for giving me this opportunity to talk about my favorite subject, Indian banks. Um, I could go on for a long time, but I promise to keep it short so that we have some time for questions at the end. And uh, I have a presentation. It's more a theoretical construct on how we should look at Indian banks. There are some peculiarities in assessing Indian banks and valuing them. Uh, so I'll be touching upon those. It's, it's, it's not so much an outlook for Indian banks as more a theoretical construct. Uh, with that disclaimer, let me straight get to it. And um, uh, so, so we we we're trying to decode uh, quality and valuations and quality is, is important. The reason I put it in the title and there's a specific reason that I had. Uh, the importance of quality cannot be underestimated when, when you know, as investors. So I'm, I'm approaching this as an investor, uh, you know, in Indian banks. And, uh, you know, in my 30 year odd years of experience, I've found that low quality banks can be value traps. It is they're, they're very risky investments and therefore the first filter that one should one should think of when investing in a bank uh, issue should be quality the track record of risk reward uh, for weak banks in india has been poor uh, and and there's a reason for it in india the macro can change rapidly and you know that is you know we 
we are right in the middle of that you know rapidly changing macro uh, and therefore one trick ponies and and weak banks uh, tend to get disproportionately hit uh, in, in those times remember these are leveraged institutions so it's not just a little bit of earnings goes off right it's it's that you know serious uh, demolition of capital can happen uh, where, where, when, when one looks at a weak bank. So one has to be very careful, you know, where, in, where, when investing in a bank, you have to, the first filter that we believe you should look at are, um, uh, uh, is quality. Uh, a couple of disclaimers uh, to, on that. One, of course, you, there are turnarounds do happen. There are a couple that we have, we've seen in the last four or five years, but they are few and far between. When a turnaround is happening, the most difficult thing to, do, to, to figure out whether this is a structural or a cyclical turnaround. And you know, I've seen many investors burn their hands you know, in Indian banks saying, oh, this is a cyclical upturn. This must be the structural turnaround. Let's jump in and then the next cycle hits and we are back to square one. Um, so the second warning that I will give you is that the converse is not true. To invest in a bank, quality is important. But to assume that if you just invest in a quality bank, you will uh, compound your returns automatically without any other filters like valuations is also not true, which is why we have a have a you know deepish dive into valuations at the end of this presentation. So, so you know the overarching theme of this of this of this presentation is how do you assess quality and how do you value those quality banks? These are the two things that I will broadly discuss. Um, so, you know, we have broken down the the quality into some key parameters. I'll be going through all of them. Uh, some of them are fairly well known. Some of them have introduced because I think these are new tech capabilities. Is something that 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 that. Uh, that, that uh, I think in today's day and age is very, very important in assessing the, the, the quality and I'll come to, to why. Uh, leadership and culture is the other thing that we've discovered over the last 10 years that uh, a lot of the other boxes get ticked, but if le leadership and culture is not, then, you know, banks tend to, uh, investors can tend to get their, their, their fingers burned. So these are two, two sort of slightly differentiated, softer aspects one has to look at beyond just the numbers as far as quality parameters are concerned. Balance sheet strength, obviously, right? These are leveraged institutions. They borrow money and lend money. If the balance sheet is not strong, the slightest bit of a shock can send, send, send a lending institution into a ta tailspin. One qualification that I'd like to say this, you know, while I'll refer to, to banks, these are equally true of non-bank lenders. So, you know, I'm not going to say banks and NBFCs each time, but broadly, the same rules apply when you're looking at an NBFC as well. Um, so there are two legs on which balance sheet strength lies. The first is a strong deposit base. And the, the you know, the I've listed why, you know, and, and, and you can you can go through that, and these are fairly the one has to look at the converse and, and then look, you know, understand why a deposit base is important. If you're if your cost of funds is higher than your peers, then it is almost impossible to build a strong business model for a bank because uh, the, the business model depends on a diversified uh, pool of uh, diversified portfolio of assets. If your cost of funds are higher, the lowest risk assets you cannot invest in. Therefore, you try to move to the higher end of the risk curve. And then when the down cycle comes that the, the NPLs and the credit costs hit you very hard and you're back to square one. So the strong deposit base is, is not just because it gets you a better margin, because it helps you last through the cycle. Um, more also, you know, the differentiation between in cost of funds of stronger and weaker banks tends to widen when the cycle is at its lowest. Uh, so, so, you know, it, it is a, there's a softer aspect to the strong deposit base. The other thing that I've also uh, alluded to here is that uh, unless you have a strong depositor base, uh, it is almost impossible to cross sell opportunities. Remember, deposit is the first point of contact that the, that most customers have uh, with, with the bank. And therefore, and by and large, it is very difficult to build a profitable bank 
you know, without uh, selling multiple products to each customer. Now, this last assumption is being challenged in recent times because you've seen some institutions use payments as the lever to get into uh, to, to get into customers. Uh, it's a more difficult path, but we've seen some some um, some uh, uh, in newer institutions do that. But by and large. It is deposits which helps you get into the customer and cross-sell products, and it remains one of the most important parts of the bank. The capital position is obviously important. Um, uh, it is it is a you know post GFC before the GFC you know in the 2000s I've I've actually modeled banks with tier one capital ratios of six percent. Believe me, believe you know you know and everybody thought that that was fine. But post GFC, the kind of, of shock that you know a couple of banks in the West went under, uh, did that kind of leverage is no more acceptable. So if you don't have capital buffer, the regulator will come at you. Uh, your counterparties will not allow you to do transactions. That will affect your ability to do corporate business. So it's a it's a sort of it's a uh, knock on domino effect that will start. So it is almost a non-negotiable that you have a robust capital position. You, We've seen that a lot of private sector banks who seemingly had strong balance sheets still raise more capital uh, in the last three, four years. That is because the marketplace has become very tough and you need to have a, uh, have a robust capital position. So you know, as, a, as an equity investor, stay away from banks with weak capital uh, ratios. Then, you know, that is, you know, that, that may optically uh, raise profitability for some time, but over the cycle that tends to hurt these banks uh, disproportionately. Um, so this is a slightly complicated numbers. I will just give you the, the key takeaway here is that, and I'm sorry, I'm looking at a, a bigger screen to, 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 to be able to look at the numbers, is that we are seeing a very clear correlation between your quality man numbers, like cost of funds, share of retail deposits. You know, you look at an Indusind bank, right? It's a trading at 1.3, and that's because it, it has a low CASA ratio and it has its share of retail deposits is very low, right? Um, you look at Bajaj Finance, it is trading at a high market. There are other reasons. I'm not saying this is the only reason, but you know, it, it trades at a high multiple and look at its capital position. It is an NBFC operating in a slightly riskier segment and it compensates by having a very high capital ratio, much higher than what the regulator demands. So, so these, are, these are ways in which you manage, uh, you know, uh, shocks. And, uh, you know, this, is, this goes to show how strong the management is. Uh, so, Mr. Sheshadri, like, you know, if I can interject, uh, I think you talked about uh, regulations in the previous slide and like, you know, weak capital buffer and what happens and so on. Uh, there is also like, you know, in this slide, we are talking about CASA ratio and so on, which talks about liquidity, right? And regulations potentially impact liquidity. So, can you talk about some of how regulations exactly drive some of these uh, numbers and how did in turn impacts like valuation, right, of uh, banking? Yeah, I'll give you a couple of examples. For example, if 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 you know the CET ratio is does not meet standards, and these are you know, not even regulatory standards. These are you know unless you have a significant buffer over over the 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 the, the, regu the regulatory standard, at some stage growth starts getting affected, right? From all accounts, your borrowing costs go up. Your your counterparties refuse to deal with you. The regulator may also intervene and said you know you have to slow down your growth. So if you want to grow, right, regulators will insist that, that you have a high, high capital ratio, right? Um, if, if, for example, the deposit profile is not, not, you know, in India especially, there is a lot of what is called moral situation, right? It may not be an explicit guideline, but the RBI gently nudges banks in a certain direction. Right. So uh, unless you have a, a, a strong deposit base, the regulator may not. So if, if you try to run a bank with a 20 percent CASA ratio and a 30 percent exposure to unsecured loans, uh, be sure that, you know, the regulator will come at, uh, come and, and you know, intervene at some stage. So uh, it's not just, you know, the regulation you know, in India, the RBI doesn't leave it at that. There are nudges. Uh, so that accidents don't happen, so that the accidents are averted before. So, uh, so the regulator keeps a very close eye on these numbers, uh, and and that's how regulation comes comes into play. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, uh, this, the next part of, of building a good bank is credit control. And, uh, you know, I, I, I won't go through this slide, uh, but the credit control is not just individual policies, how many people you have in collections, how many. As an investor, the thing that you need to look at, and I'll leave it at that, I won't go into the detail. You can look at the presentation, read them, and there's a lot of literature about this as well is that uh, one has to look at the culture of credit in, the, in that institution. That is what tells you. The numbers will tell you, uh, tell that to you for sure. I mean, if you look, look at a 10-year you know, history of how their NPL cycles has been, that tells you about the culture of credit. But there are softer aspects to, to, to the culture of credit. Is the uh, how independent is the credit team? Uh, you know, recently I think most banks have moved there, but there was a time when the head of credit would report to the head of the business. The head of corporate credit would have to report to the head of corporate banking. These are certain red flags there that you see because an independence of credit. How how uh, strong is the policy? Um, if, if you look at retail, for example. Uh, everybody say, oh, we are looking at the best customers, et cetera, but what are they doing in the marketplace, right? Uh, are you picking up from, from your channel checks, et cetera, that this bank is a little willing, willing to go a little further. If you speak to DSAs, for example, uh, uh, and you will get a sense of whether, you know, when a case file comes to the bank and it's, it's not quite the best credit, uh, are, they, are they, you know, more accepting or, you know, is the credit department, you know, very difficult. If you hear sales guys complain about the credit department in a particular bank, uh, then that's a great sign. So, you know, the there are all these little things that you need to look at, and I've said it, but you have to assess the credit culture of the bank. Uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, um, and, and how they approach credit. Uh, and how uh, how structured it is within within the banks you know i'm i'm, I'm uh, you know going round and round a little bit here but uh, that is the most important thing the rest is detail the rest is detail whether you know the bank is willing so so let me put it simply whether the bank is willing to refuse business uh, because they are uncomfortable with the credit if you get and get examples of that uh, and then, you know, that is a great box ticked. Uh, and some of the best banks which have delivered consistent profitability over cycles, you will find that uh, there is a, a credit manager or a, or a credit head who can say no to anyone, right? So, so, so that, that is, the, you know, that is the, the biggest point that you, uh, the, that you would have. Um, I, again, as I said, I won't go into all the details, uh, but you know, you can come here, bring it up in questions later. Um, so this is a, a chart which tells you that uh, there are no free lunches as far as credit is concerned. Uh, the more credit risk you take, uh, the, the more you pay for with a lagged impact. So sometimes, so what I've done is taken the credit costs over FI 20 and 21 versus the yield in FI 19, right? Uh, so, so what that tells you, and, and that's a very important thing when you look at credit, you know, sometimes you'll find that when I come to profitability later that the margins are great and the credit costs are low and you think, oh, this, this bank or this NBFC has cracked it. It's, they're, they're, they're one of the best lenders. But you will find that two years later, they will pay for it in credit, credit costs. So you should always look at a 10-year um, uh, 10, 10 sort of chart and see what happens with a lag. Uh, that, that is you know, a very important metric to look at when you're looking at uh, how strong the credit culture is within, within the bank. If there are these cycles that happen that you see very good yields for a couple of years, then very high credit costs, then you know that that business is inherently a little more risky. The quality of that bank is not as good as some of the others. I understood. So just to, uh, just to clarify, these numbers uh, in your previous slide were uh, over a cycle is what you, is that, is that, is that so, right? Yes, I'm not saying over a full cycle, but this gives you a little color of how lags impact uh, 
the the uh, the the uh, how credit costs need to be looked at with a lag, not as a, on a concurrent basis. I understand. Uh, the other thing is, and I, I I use the word one trick pony at the beginning of the presentation, and and you, this is a business where sort of size begets size, scale begets scale, and one has to keep a very sort of close eye on that. And there are three ways in which uh, you know products and distribution matter. Uh, Branch network, for example, uh, is, is important. And then there, you know, I've been seeing banks over 30 years, and I've seen some of these banks start with very small branch networks. And there's an inflection point. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a term that we use, us banks analysts use long before the current uh, internet analysts use it. It's called the network effect, right? When you go to beyond a certain size of branch, all the product, all the branches in your network start start to see an uptick in in in, in profitability, uh, or in or in productivity more than profitability. So you you need to expand the branch network. Uh, a bank with a limited branch network is uh, uh, will will struggle. So so that that is you know it's it's in, in India it is still very very important that one has a strong branch network. A uh, product width is also important. Uh, the, you know, the, it is important for customer retention, loan book balance, cost effectiveness, everything. So, uh, beware of one trick ponies is something that I will keep saying. You know, if you're a monoline product, it is very difficult to last through cycles, make money. Um, and, and we're seeing some of that play out in recent times. Um, the third thing is, and this is underestimated as far as distribution, is partnerships, right? Uh, and we are seeing it, you, you'll see, you know, OEM relationships, right? If you go to buy a certain consumer durable or a certain car, you will find that a certain bank is preferred and you will end up taking a loan from that bank. So this creates a stickiness uh, with, with, you know, for that lender and gives it a cost advantage over some of the others. In many cases, there is a subvention also paid. Um, uh, DSA networks are, you know, uh, you know, over dependence on DSA networks are bad, but they're also important. Third party collaborations are becoming increasingly important, especially in the technology era. And I will cover that a little bit when I come to the technology uh, part of my presentation. Uh, lots of points here. I won't go through all of them, but this is super important. We've seen that, right? That leadership and culture. I talked about credit culture, uh, but overall culture in in leadership. Uh, there are three points that I that I want to want to discuss here, uh, and, and I leave it at that. I won't go through all of them. First, there is now this debate about uh, CEO and leadership continuity, and whether you know what is optimum. The RBI has now. Uh, put in a maximum uh, maximum tenure of of of, uh, of uh, CEOs, and we've had both experiences, right? You know, there have been some banks where CEOs you know stayed for decades and they built a formidable institutions, uh, and there are some banks where CEOs have stayed for too long, and and a sort of uh, you know uh, complacency has set in within the entire leadership team. Uh, there is no right answer, but my uh, my um, uh, bias is towards long tenures because bank is a banking is a business that is built with a long term view in mind. It's not you can't you can't uh, plan a bank with three year cycles or two year cycles. You need to plan building a bank over five to ten year cycles. So uh, my bias is towards longer tenures. Sure, you know sometimes this this can backfire. Uh, but but we've seen, you know, there's, I think there's enough data to show that longer tenors have created better, uh, uh, better quality banks over periods of time. Uh, the second is, is uh, the homogeneity of the top two or three management strata. Uh, we, we have in, in the Indian banking, you know, in the, among the large Indian banks, top extremes. We have some banks where... Uh, the entire top management is in, is homegrown. They've joined as management trainees, moved up the ranks, and you know if you look at the top twenty people running the bank, they are all homegrown. Uh, we also have some banks where 
uh, almost nobody is, is, is homegrown. The entire top 20 are, have come in from outside. Neither is good in my opinion. And that is something one should look at because that really goes to what the culture is and, and how the bank is built. Uh, the third thing that, uh, that I will flag from this slide is reaction during adversity. That is absolutely the, um, the uh, biggest test of a bank management because however good a bank you are, you will face adversity. Uh, and how you react, first of all, in handling the adversity, and second is, is, is ensuring that such a problem never happens again. Uh, so, I, I, you know, do, we, 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 when you look at a bank, look at a 10-year history, go to moments in time when the bank was challenged, how they reacted to it, whether they keep repeating the same mistakes. These are, are, are very important. The rest of it is also important, but these are the, thing, are the three points that I want to flag, take, you know, take away from, from this slide. This is super important tech capabilities today. And again, you know, I, I use the word culture, you know, again, I will, there are specific issues that, you know, when you look at a bank, you know, you look at the UI, UX, you look at the popularity, how well it can customize, all that is important. But the biggest takeaway that you need to figure out, right, is what is the approach to tech? Uh, is what is the culture of adoption of, te of technology within, within, within the, within the uh, bank? Uh, in your daily interactions, how uh, aggressive is the bank in, in adopting technology to help you adopt technology? Um, and, and, uh, and whether, uh, and this is important, whether they look at technology as something that is cost saving for the bank or whether it is something that is helping the customer. This has become, you know, five years ago, it wasn't so important. 10 years ago, it wasn't so important. But today, uh, with you know most both, most Indians spending so much time on their mobiles and 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 using technology as a as a, in their daily lives, uh, a bank which does not match that will struggle for long term growth. Um, so it is at the heart of future competitiveness. Uh, it is a key driver of your franchise longevity. And when you come to valuations, franchise longevity is very important. Uh, and it is the biggest threat today to legacy lenders. Uh, some of them are responding. Some of them are a little slow to respond. Um, but you know, from you know, last 18-month conversations that the banks are having in, on their earnings calls, you will see that they're starting to respond because it is clearly the biggest threat because the customer has become very, very demanding as far as the technology experience is concerned. Uh, so, Mr. Sheshadri, I had just a question on the previous sure. one. Uh, like, what's your quick thoughts about uh, this buy now, pay later, which is kind of like, you know, it is tech platforms also do a bit of that. Like, and there, like one of the problems which I heard is uh, uh, payments is a very low margin business. And like, you know, you need to kind of start doing some sort of lending and so on. So in the whole thing about digitization and so on, uh, where does that buy now pay later fit and what's the threat to the banking business from that phenomenon? Um, I'll give you a slightly long response. To start with buy now pay later has sort of existed in India in different formats for quite some time, right? We've, you know, for the last 10 years, we used to converting transactions to EMI. Uh, whether it is from us, from specific lenders such as Bajaj Finance, or whether it is through our credit cards for the five last five six years, so those are all buy now pay later, right? Uh, right. The specific uh, buy now pay later model, which you know, for example, some of the Australian companies etc. are talking about, are when you know the customer is not paying interest, but the seller is is paying that that interest cost to help promote his product. That also has existed in India for some time. Uh, you're absolutely right that payments is, uh, you know, in the Indian ecosystem, one, you cannot run a profitable standalone payments business unless it's B2B, which is, you know, not that scalable. So to, to convert a successful payments franchise into a profitable entity, the easiest path is lending. Right. Uh, and yes, to some extent, some of these digital players are, are uh, growing very fast. I wouldn't go as far as to say that there are threats to lenders. I think that that would be, you know, the market is big enough for everyone, but you will see new paradigms come on. 
uh, and there will be sort of new uh, new ways uh, new ways in which uh, the um, uh, you know lending business will be done uh, my belief is that the market is big enough for everyone uh, i also believe that some of the buy now pay later models that exist in the market will not survive some of them uh, some of them will some of them i will not survive because they are uh, not you know and we go back we discuss quality right they are trying to skirt you know they're trying to be a little too uh, they're, they're sacrificing quality for expediency if that, that that's the way so some of them don't report it to the bureau some of them are you know putting in structures where where you know the kyc is not being done some of them are not doing proper credit checks and we've seen in the last one week you know these ones the rbi is is, is not comfortable with and they're tightening regulations because of that uh, i think we will get a comprehensive uh, set of digital lending regulations from the rbi and there'll be more clarity when we do that uh, so so the short takeaway is that uh, i think some buy now pay later models will thrive uh, banks if they get their act together banks and traditional nbfcs will certainly not be left out of that uh, but they may have to share a little bit of the of the pie with, with some of the incumbents and some of the incumbents will uh, struggle because they are not building quality businesses uh, uh, at this point in time thank you um, so I will, uh, again, lots of numbers, but I will point out three things here. Uh, the first is if you look at Indus in bank between 2016 and 22, this is the, um, uh, this is the ROA tree. Sorry, I didn't spend too much time. This is how a bank's profitability should look at lots of, 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 uh, 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 huge alphabet soup here. I will again, not go into all the details, but. I'll just give you, you know, a little bit of sample of, of how one should look at it. You look at Indus in Bank in 2016 uh, was very fee heavy. It, it had a fees to total income of, of 29%, which was the best in class, right? Uh, and that drove an ROA of 1.8%. Of uh, when the credit cycle turned and when it had to pull back on some of some of its uh, you know aggressive uh, lending some of that disappeared and the roa went back to 1.2% right so so when you look at the roa tree one has to look at these these potential points where one has to where one can um, uh, you know where the bank may be a little vulnerable you look at bandhan bank which is uh, you know you it had a great net interest margin in 2018, but look at what happened to the credit costs in 2022, right? You look at the credit costs here in 2022, and it ate up a lot of the profitability in the previous years. Uh, and if you look at the, the third point I would like to, to make here is uh, between HDFC Bank and Bajaj Finance. Uh, if you look at the ROA in 2019, and I've deliberately chosen 2019 because it was a pre-COVID, you know, steady state kind of scenario, it is almost double. But being a non-bank, it cannot lever as much as a bank. So while the ROA gap is huge, the ROA gap is much smaller because it cannot lever it. So one has to look at these nuances when looking at, at a DuPont or, a, or an ROE tree uh, for some of these large lenders. Uh, there are, you know, I could spend hours and hours discussing this this chart. It's it is, uh, it's the moment where the rubber hits the road. When I look at a bank, I look at a ten-year table of this, and it tells me so many stories. Uh, but I leave these three with you and and move on because you know I I, I, I don't want to spend too much time. Um, so I'm sorry, Mr. Shishadri, there was one question on what what do you mean by credit cost so i just wanted to pick it up just now because okay, my apologies right we get caught up in the, the jargon credit cost is very simply your uh, npl provisions divided by the average loans uh, in that period so your credit cost for fy 22 financial year 22 is the total npl provisions that you've made in that in that year divided by the average of the opening and closing loan book i understand thank you so if you earn a 10% yield on your loans and you have 2% credit cost, that means you earned an interest income of 10%, but you've given back 2% of that uh, as NPL costs. 
Got it. Thank you. Um, again, this is, you know, an area where one can get into really, you know, esoteric stuff. I'll try and keep it as simple as possible. Um, price to book is the industry standard and it's used because bank earnings are prone to one-offs. I just showed you what can happen to credit costs with a lag, etc. So it's it's not, not you know, earnings, P is not, you know, for really high quality banks, which with low cyclicality in earnings, uh, a lot of some some analysts do use uh, you know a, a PE, uh, but the price to book is the industry standard because of the cyclicality in the earnings. Um, the uh, the price to book that you assign, is, however, is still based on an income based model. So ultimately, you're valuing earnings and you're not valuing the asset. So I just want to clarify that. So you can use the dividend discount model or the ROE growth model. Uh, or the residual income, the, the, you know, those are two routes to get get to the same point. Uh, you know, there is very little difference between the two. Um, there, there's also a question that we have got, you know, I as an and banks, Indian banks and this have got is that are these high Indian banks at one point, not, not so much now, but at one point Indian banks were valued higher than most banks in the region and you know as, as an analyst when i used to go and speak to pitch you know indian banks to fund you know investors in the in, uh, anywhere outside india everybody said you know what is the logic of these these are just driven by perception etc they are not they were driven by fundamental factors and i'll come to that uh, but you know the if you forget that they are driven by these fundamental factors one will not be able to figure out why these numbers change so uh, the key valuation drivers, this is if you use a dividend discount model, which is the, the model that I have used over uh, most of my career. Um, these are, you know, cost of equity in beta, which is, you know, how risky the bank is, the return on equity, which is the sustainable profitability of the bank, how fast it is growing. This is the slippery one, and I won't go through all of that, but this is the slippery one uh, because you know, finance theory will tell you that the growth in your book value per share is, is approximately equal to your ROE, less whatever dividends you pay. But Indian banks, it's been different because they've managed to raise capital at higher multiples over cycles, right? So if you forget that and, and you try and value it, you will miss. Uh, that is a very important factor in how to value Indian banks. And if you don't factor that in, you will miss uh, what what the uh, uh, you know true value of that bank is? Um, this is the example, uh, and uh, there are two charts. One shows you what the growth in the BVPS is of the bank compared to its ROE, and you can see for most of these high quality lenders, it is significantly above what the ROE is. This is you know over a twenty year period, except for Bajaj, which is a ten year period. Um, the other, the chart on the right tells you the contribution of outside capital to the net worth of the bank. Uh, and these are also very high. These are not things that you, numbers that you usually come across in Western banks, which are growing at slower rates. So if you forget these two factors, if you forget these stats, then you will misprice and, and, and your valuation model will not stand up to the scrutiny of what the market actually is doing. Again, you know, no, will not, uh, you know, this is a, a very, very dense slide. So I will, uh, I'll just walk you through, uh, please go through it. And this tells you the sensitivity and uh, I'll just show you one, the North um, East quadrant uh, here, whereas the growth, so, you know, in any DCF model or dividend discount model, you have a second stage growth. You grow till 25 and then you assign a growth uh, in a growth expectation between 25 and say 45, which is what I do, but you can take 10 years. And this shows you the sensitivity of that growth, right? Of that growth number to the valuation. So if you take 20 years, right? If you're here and you take 20 years, I don't know whether you can see my, my, my uh, slide, uh, my, my pointer, but, and you move right, you will see that the valuation goes up materially as you assume higher growth. 
So the, the limited point that I'm making here is that when Indian banks get valued at four or five times price time to book, the market is assigning a high growth number, which is what, what, what is, what is uh, uh, there. So um, uh, one final, you know, one of my, you know, uh, something that I have discussed, you know, uh, when you use price to adjusted book, it is only applicable for distressed banks. Otherwise just use the stated book value. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. I think I've overshot a little bit of my time. So I'll, I'll stop here and take questions. Yeah, no, this is, uh, this is great, Sushma uh, Shadri. So uh, there have been like quite a few questions, but uh, I'll probably start with uh, like a, a theme uh, of, uh, you know, the credit costs and yields. So there have been a few questions about it. And uh, I think like, you know, one, one person asked, uh, like, you know, how do you spot potential derating of valuation? Another person asked, you mentioned cost of credit as a lagging indicator for health. So what do you, what do you, what do you consider some of the leading indicators that you, that you will look at as a red flag, right? Uh, so, so essentially, like you know, and and potentially uh, the example that the person has cited is uh, you know, uh, this NBFC has highest uh, yields as well as highest credit costs, uh, but uh, investors are slaves to growth, and uh, you know the NBFC is pushing growth, but it's coming at a credit cost. Uh, so, how do you spot the danger sign, and how do you know like you know where it's pushing it beyond? It's a very good question. Uh, numbers will only take you so far. And if you go back to the slide that I had put out on the credit culture, that will tell you uh, that is the biggest danger sign. So, you know, it's not all about the numbers. It is about the credit culture. It is getting yields, but how is it getting the yields? What kind of customers is it lending to? Uh, and I've listed a lot of ways, like you look at what, the, you know, what their collection architecture is, what kind of credit underwriting is there? Are they, are they fast and loose? It's okay to have a slightly high credit cost if you're earning the yields. It is just that if it is priced, if it's not priced for it, then, then, then that is where you get into trouble. So the biggest lead indicator is the credit culture and how they're behaving in the marketplace. Understood. Right? You know, in, before 2008, there were banks which were distributing credit cards at street corners. That is a, you know, a, a big warning sign. Right. Extreme one, but big warning sign. So uh, there was a question on uh, governance, which I thought was interesting. So uh, I think uh, they they mentioned like you know, look, long tenure is good, but uh, even the bluest blue chips. Uh, I think the example cited was HDFC Bank uh, has shown problems when the tenure exceeds ten years under investment in tech uh, to show that growth. Uh, so so like you know, would you kind of say that a cap? on tenure, like the one I think RBI has already kind of like, you know, put out, that's a, that's a good way to kind of make sure that, that the balance is there between long tenure and, uh, you know, not being too, uh, what do you call, uh, you also need to adapt, right? So like adaptability as well as stability. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I, yes, I think there is an optimal tenure. Too long is also, you know, apart from anything else, you need some fresh thinking beyond beyond the point. Uh, I'm not. You know, I think you know the example is somewhat uncharitable, but but uh, but uh, um, uh, but uh, yes, I think uh, hard. You know, in the absence of any other, in, in an ideal world, a board would function as a as as a counterweight to, to, to that. But sometimes we've seen that that doesn't work. So right. in the absence of, of the overall governance structures where boards may not be as strong as you as you would want them to be, who would keep a CEO in check, who would spot that you know something is not going right and, and you know gently push for a CEO change, maybe a hard hard stop is is uh, is good. Uh, but again, you know, I go back. My biases towards there's, there's no, you know, there's no absolute truth. But if I if I was to ask, I would say my bias is towards longer tenure because right. on balance we have seen that that creates more value for investors. Got it. Got it. Uh, so there was a question on uh, public sector banks and uh, they're potentially like you know having low valuation 
so is there a, is there a difference in characteristic between a public sector bank and a private bank when it comes to like you know what like you know so uh, in the slide the valuation p by b ratios for public sector banks were lower uh, so can you talk a little bit about the different types of banks and how does what's driving yeah. The, the public sector banks are valued lower for three reasons. One, their ROEs tend to be lower by and large. Okay. Uh, two, their uh, growth rates also tend to be lower. We've seen that in the last 25 years, the public sector banks have ceded market share to private sector in a fairly large manner, right? I Meaning it's, it's uh, uh, you know, I think private sector is now 35, 40%, uh, if I remember right. Uh, so, you know, market doesn't like, uh, a group of, of companies which are losing market share, right? You know, market share is, is, is an important driver of valuations. Uh, thirdly, you've seen large credit shocks. Uh, so, so therefore the benefit of the doubt is not given. The only positive that, prior, that PSU banks have today is that their deposit, especially after, you know, 2019-20, their deposit bases are holding up. Their deposit bases are very strong. Some of them are harnessing technology to, uh, to convert that deposit base into a profitable franchise. So I wouldn't dismiss all of them. Uh, but as I said in my first slide, bank turnarounds are very tough to for spot and make money from. When you do it, you, you when you get it right, it can be hugely rewarding, uh, but it's very tough to, to get it right. I understand. Um, I hope you can hear me because my screen is frozen a bit. I can um, hear you clearly uh, and we can see you as well clearly. Okay. All right, all right, okay. Like fingers crossed. Uh, so, so, so there was a question about interest rates and bank profitability. I thought that was interesting. So uh, like the theory says that bank profitability should increase with increase in interest rates. So what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, now you've frozen, but let me, let me answer. Uh, uh answer that uh yes in theory bank profitability should rise with interest rates but it's way more complex than that uh first of all there is competition right so therefore some of the gains are given back uh because of competitive pressures uh so you know you may have 40 percent casa which doesn't reprice your loan price book reprices you should you know get a higher name but you you pass on some of that because of the uh, because of the higher uh, competition and remember at the early part of the of the interest rate rising cycle where we are right now it is true that profitability tends to go up because of floating rate loans etc but at the latter part that is when the economy starts to slow down and credit costs start to hit you so i'm not a big fan of this one dimensional analysis you have to look at what the second order and third order impacts are uh, and by and large, you know, my belief is that your profitability depends on your competitiveness and your moats. The best banks show very similar ROAs through the interest rate cycle. Maybe your margins will go up and your treasury will go down and, and stuff like that. But by and large, the best banks show consistent profitability through the rate cycle. So, you know, I don't obsess too much about that. But in theory, you're right. At the early part of the interest rate cycle, banks tend to make more money. I understand. So, uh, so there was a, you know, lots of questions. So I'm just picking a few. Um, so your last slide was on distressed banks, right? So are there any considerations for valuing distressed banks? Yes. Uh, the reason why I breeze through it is that my advice is not to invest in distressed banks. Is they're very, very tricky, and the risk reward is is very, uh, very unfavorable. But if you are, uh, then you have to look at two things. One, uh, whether the bank, whether there is any overdue, whether there's any provisioning left to be done, right? Uh, and you discount for that. So both in terms of in India, that's a big problem, unrecognized NPAs and whether the recognized NPAs have been properly provisioned. Rule of thumb is assume that, you know, at least a 70% provision on all potential stressed assets is needed. Now it's a rule of thumb. It can differ somewhere between 60 and 80, but you know, in the absence of more information, assume 70. So you adjust the capital for that. The second thing is that whether the bank after adjusting for this needs more capital, uh, because distressed banks find it very difficult to, to raise capital. And if they, 
or they, they raise capital at you know levels that will dilute existing uh, uh, shareholders, right? Because the stock trades at half times price to book. Uh, so you once you adjust for all of that, and then you want you know these are the two most important adjustments one has to make when looking at a distress bank. Uh, but you know my uh, my. Um, uh, Advice is stay away from distress banks. India has plenty of high quality banks which deliver you compounding returns. It's, it's not, uh, you know, it's not worth the risk to, to look at distress banks. I understand, I understand. Um, so I think there was a question about uh, presentation. So that's for me. Uh, so I think the webinar presentation will be available in the chat box. Um, you know, I don't know if it's already there, um, but it should be available in the chat box um, once uh, once, it, once it concludes. Um, so there was a, a, another question about uh, yeah. So between DCF and price to book, uh, you know. So I think you talked about price to book. Like between DCF and price to book, is there a preference, and uh, what are those consideration models? Oh, there, it's not an either or. So you have to arrive at a price to book multiple and to arrive at the price to book multiple, you should be using a dividend discount model or a, uh, or a residual income model. Uh, now these are the both are very assumption based. So there, you know, do, do not assume that these are objective ways to look at it. Ultimately one has to use one's uh, judgment and, and look at very closely at all the assumptions that one takes. But to arrive at a price to book multiple, one has to use either a dividend discount model or a residual income model. Uh, DCF is not that applicable for banks. Understood, understood, understood. Um, so there were a couple of uh, people asking question about the contribution of outside capital. So I think you made a point about outside capital and you need to adjust it. So, so can you explain that? So, so your net worth is composed of two kinds of capital. One which has been generated by profits at the bank itself. One has been raised by raising capital in the outside markets, right? We, the Indian banks raise capital every three to five years. So as of today, the, the, the contribution of share premium to, to net worth is the number that, that is the contribution of outside capital. I understand, I understand. Um, so, you know, so there is a, like, you know, RBI is a increase, increasing interest rates and there is a tightening of cycle. And uh, so the question is, uh, there, is a, there is a potential conflicts between bank receiving higher yields and the pressure of the demand drying up from uh, from business demand drying up. So, how do you quantify the two factors? Um, uh, you know that happens with a lag, and only when you know. If you, my uh, su suggestion would be to look at a twenty-year interest rate chart, right? And you'll find that we are well below you know minimum levels uh, of 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 uh, you know so there is no free lunch you cannot expect demand to come and interest rates not to rise right when interest rates stay low that means demand is bad so at the early part of the tightening cycle there is no problem with demand once it crosses a certain level and you know starts hitting you know historic highs that is when demand slows down so at this point i wouldn't worry too much about that understood so, uh, so there were questions. So I wouldn't like, you know, I mean, I don't want to take a specific name, but the general question is, there were banks which were kind of like RBI intervened and there was like, you know, they, they, it was merged and it was taken over and so on. Uh, do you like, you know, have you seen those interventions work like in those few cases, some are cooperative banks, somewhere like actual commercial lender and so on. Uh, have these interventions worked in uh, like most of these cases? Um, see, by and large, most of them over my career that I've seen, and I've seen a few where the RBI have ended up being merged with larger banks. And then obviously, you know, the problems are sorted out because, you know, the larger banks are much larger. Uh, I haven't seen too many, you know, actual turnarounds uh, in, in banks at, at RBI, uh, but uh, there are a couple in the works at the moment, look, which look interesting, which may work in my opinion, but, uh, but historically, most of them have ended up being acquired or merged with another bank. Understood. 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 Um, 
So, here are the six. so I, I have actually one question myself. Uh, so that's on ESG. And the reason I'm asking is, you know, I'm fresh off an exam yesterday. So I think you talked about the, like, you know, different like growth rates and, uh, you know, cost of capital and all these things, right? So, and I like clearly you talked about some of the factors like uh, governance, the tenure and those kind of things. Uh, is there like, you know, a systematic way uh, that you look at the, the E, S, or G factors that you think is material? I think you mentioned a few, but are there others that you'll say that, look, I will probably adjust this driver, maybe the growth rate or cost of capital or something like that based on this, um, this factor? Yeah, at Alchemy, we've started doing that. Uh, we, we assign our own ESG scores and then try and adjust the valuations that we assign to these banks based on that. Uh, it is very important. It is, however, an absolute minefield for us investors because there are no objective parameters on which to value these, the, the, you know, uh, getting data or looking at it. Uh, but, you know, that's the story of analysts, right? We, you know, we have to deal in an imperfect world. So we make the best of whatever the information is. Uh, just because the information is not there is no excuse for not doing it. And, and, and I think one has to look at it. As I said, you know, most of what I said is about governance, right? Governance is, is there. It is the most important. S is also becoming an increasingly important factor, right? In India, S has played a factor because you had priority sector targets, etc. So, you know, the PSU banks were forced to meet social objectives. So, uh, so in India, the, the, the industry was a little different. The RBI, you know, I remember 10, 12, 12, maybe 15 years ago, the RBI put a lot of pressure on the private sector bank saying you have to meet your priority sector. So S has been part of the system for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, the E part is, is relatively new uh, and, and, and that we are trying to figure out as we go along. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to probably take one question and uh, we probably need to kind of uh, conclude. Uh, so, the, so the regulation, so do you see regulations becoming more conducive to enable neo banks to get banking licenses? Because that is the first point of contact for Gen Z or millennial customers. And, uh, you know, so and, and what's the like, you know, like, let me put it this way. So the likelihood as well as the potential threat from some of these uh, new banks getting like banking line, full banking licenses and stuff. Um, I will not try and predict where the regulation goes because it is impossible. Not because I, you know, because I'm, I'm really poor at it. It's, it's not, you know, I can't read a regulator's minds. Right. Uh, so so I, I will, you know, if with your permission, duck that question. But the broader, but the broader answer is that yes, neo banks are here to come. Uh, we, I, I expect that you know, if if the new if the neo banks are not allowed to do it, some of the banks will develop neo banks within their existing banks. Uh, but the the fully digital experience uh, that that your 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 customer craves, and it's you know not just. Millennials, I think a lot of, uh, you know, uh, boomers like me, I'm not a boomer, but, you know, near boomers like me, uh, also, you know, people of my generation also create a, you know, everybody wants to, to, to have the best digital experience when, 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 they're, when they're interacting with their bank. Uh, and I think some of, you know, it may come a little later, but some of the uh, legacy banks will deliver much vastly improved digital experiences. So, Again, don't know what what where the regulation will have, whether standalone new banks will be allowed or not. Uh, but you will get a similar experience out of existing banks sooner rather than later. I understand. I understand. Uh, so, Mr. Sheshadri, thank you so much for sharing your, your insights with us today. Um, I think we are at the hour. And uh, as a reminder to our listeners, uh, you know, I think I think the question the survey was put up. Uh, you know, if you see it in your screen. Uh, please do complete the evaluation survey. Uh, CFA Institute slash society members may claim professional learning credit by logging on their professional learning tracking tool. Uh, so we have a few upcoming uh, webinars coming up. Uh, please do uh, register if not done already. Uh, our next uh, webinar is on uh, career insights into ESG investing. Uh, you know, once again, my favorite topic. Uh, so from Lokesh Marik, uh, CFA, FRM, 
vice president SSDA India. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, the uh, India Wealth Management Conference on 28 July. Uh, and if you haven't registered, please do so. We have an excellent lineup of speakers. Uh, you know, so that's uh, like that's also there. And uh, lastly, uh, we also have uh, our next practitioners insights webinar on uh, uh, 28 July. I'm sorry. Uh, did I did I get the date wrong? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. India Wealth Management Conference on 9th of August. Uh, please pardon me. And our next practitioners insights webinar uh, is on uh, 28 July. So we have a great lineup of uh, conferences and events coming up. Uh, so please, uh, like, you know, register if you haven't done so already. Uh, with that, I want to, like, you know, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Sheshadri, and thank everyone for participating and coming up with excellent questions throughout the session. Thank, thank you. you, Shiva. Thank you, Harshad and the CFA team. And thank you for inviting me. I, I had a great time. I hope you guys did too. Thank you so much. Thank you.